So, uh, Rod, do you want to do some introductions? Yeah, I'll do the introductions. We have with us three wonderful individuals, and I'm going to start with Ian Wishart. Um, Charles Ian Wishart, he's best known within the UK Guyanese diaspora as one of the founder members of the Queen's College Association UK. His knowledge of growing up in colonial British Guyana and his eventual move to the United Kingdom is filled with stories and anecdotes that paint a picture of what life was like for young Ian in Georgetown post World War II. Our other, our other guest is um, Alexander de Great. Now, Alexander is has was born in Trinidad, and he came here at the age of three. Um, Alexander de Great is he's a leading modern day Calypsonian out, outside of the outside of the Caribbean. In other words, he's based here, but he's um, all. Calypso. Um, he's Trinidadian born, raised in England, and has enjoyed a widely, a wide variety, um, a widely sorry, varied a career, widely, a widely, <laughs> widely varied career. I'm sorry. And I got that, um, that, that, that has seen him work alongside many fine musicians. And recently he could be seen on Britain's Got Talent, wishing the Queen uh, health, health and happiness in a song celebrating her platinum jubilee and he's going to perform it for us today but not only that actually he has some experiences that he's going to share with us from a trinidadian or a caribbean perspective so we thank you for joining us alexander and finally um joyce trotman auntie joyce as she's fine as she is formerly known um she graduated in 1951 with first class um, certificate from Government Training College um, for Teachers in Guyana. And after serving as a primary school teacher, she traveled to England as a postgraduate student, obtaining a degree in arts London at London University and a certificate of education at the University of Durham. She returned to Guyana, was appointed a senior lecturer in English at the Government Training College for Teachers, which is her alma mater. After reading linguistics at the University of Lancaster in 1968, she was appointed research fellow at the University of Guyana from 1972 to 1987. Joyce later migrated to England and taught at Scott Liggett's Boys Comprehensive School and became head of remedial, uh, the remedial department dealing mainly with literacy. Uh, Auntie Joyce, as all, most of you will know, is a nonagenarian, which is quite a feat. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, has many um, amazing memories of Guyana, um, particularly from the really early 20th century days. So it'd be interesting to hear what Auntie Joyce um, has to share. But um, I just wanted to start with the question, uh, Rod. No. Okay. So um, the question about, you know, empire, to what extent were people kind of aware of being part of something bigger than, you know, British Guyana, being being part of, of, of empire? And maybe if I could start with uh, Ian, could I, could I pose that question to you? Can you hear me okay? We certainly can. Good. Firstly, just, just let me um, say that this business of founder member of Queen's College Association. I was at the first meeting, but I wasn't instrumental in actually setting it up. But um, I came away, I think they made me secretary or something. <clears throat> and um, another, another, another thing before I got to answer your question, does Joan Plummer still make those marvelous patties? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and Metai. Oh, she's muted, I think. <laughs> Yes, I do, and, but no, and, uh, no. what? I'm suffering a, with a broken hip. Oh, well, you don't make parties with your hip. <laughs> <laughs> I can't get out to shop. <laughs> House bound. Oh, dear. I hope you're getting better, though, Auntie Jen. And, 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 and just one, one other thing before I forget. Um, you, you mentioned the British Guyana Railway. It was the first railway in South America, not only one of the earliest ones in the world. 
And my great great grandfather, who had come out from Scotland and who was um, one of the college, a member of the College of Electors, the College of Kaisers under the old Dutch constitution. Um, he was killed in an accident and that happened on the railway. Anyway, to answer your question about being aware of being some part of something greater, of course we were all aware because there were always prominent maps displayed at schools, which about two thirds of them were colored red and that meant it was part of the empire. So we, I think we were all aware that we were part of a, a greater um, whole, if you like. Um, so, 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 so um, could you say something about that in terms of the way that you were taught at school? You know, did that, how did that impact what you were taught in terms of geography and also what you were taught about Guyana? Well, we didn't, let, let, let me begin what I taught at school. Now, remember when I first went to school, it was during the war and, um, your primary school, you, you know, were aware of things. I remember the one patriotic song we had to sing was There'll Always Be in England. Oh, yes. But, yeah. but um, by the time I went to Queen's College, and those days of the prep form, I went in and then four to three, the first year that Leonard Dolphin taught. And um, of course, a much wider curriculum in, in, in the prep form. We had a West Indian reader, so we learned about the Caribbean. I remember in the third form, we did the geography of, of British Guyana. Ernest Dow was our, our master. And um, we, we certainly at school learned the history of the slave trade and so on and the triangular bit. But as far as detailed history of British Guyana itself, well, not not very much, I would say, but we had a general idea. Um, um, Ian, how old were you when you left um, Guyana? What was I doing? No, how old were you when well, you how, left Guyana? Well, I, I came out to university first. I, I, I won a Booker Scholarship, Booker Sugar Estate Scholarship, and I studied engineering at Nottingham, and then I had a period of training, and I went back as an engineer at Blairmont Estate, and then um, a year in Georgetown. And um, that's when in 62, when I came here and leave, I decided to stay. Okay. So yeah. what I was curious about, when you were saying that you learned about the slave trade at school, that was in your secondary, uh, secondary yeah, yes, year? Yes, Queen's College, yeah. Okay. Because a lot of the people I've spoken to don't seem to remember well, being well, taught. We yeah. We certainly, I mean, it, it was about the slave trade, not specific to Guyana, oh, but I about see. the slave trade in general. Oh, so we maybe were aware to of America. this triangular thing of yeah. goods being taken from the, the UK or from Europe to West Africa, where slaves were bought and then shipped over and then sugar was shipped back. Mm. We, we were taught about that, certainly. Yeah. Auntie Joyce, what are your memories of... of, of um... Well, you, you can see the difference in ages because I, I went to school at the, um, we were, I think the establishment used the church and school to colonize us. So you knew that we didn't know we were, that we weren't dying if you were British. And so everything was British. And you learned the British songs. Um, in infant class, I learned I have got a fiddle. It is nice to see. Strings are down the middle. Father gave it me, but I didn't know what the fiddle was. <laughs> I have got a fiddle. It is nice to see. Strings are down the middle. Father gave it me. Soon I learned to play it. Listening, holding while my bow. Listen just a minute. Here is so and do. What's so and do? What's a fiddle? Nobody told you. But we sang it. And at a border Roman Catholic school, strictly Roman Catholic, but we were singing when um when mighty roast beef was an Englishman's food. Oh the roast beef of all England and oh for all England's roast beef. When we got to Smith Memorial, uh, Smith Memorial School, we had to, we were taught all the, the, the um the the English folk songs. 
And to um, Joyce, what was the one you were telling me about before where you said there was like the red, white, and blue? Uh, that... I think it's the early, early book of the West century, the Old Roman Catholic. We all chanted in that class, red, white, and blue. These are the colors of your flag. Red says be brave. White says be pure. Blue says be true. But we didn't know it, you know, you're English. As a little girl, I go to my Uncle Eddie's house. He was a postmaster, so maybe he had a kind of position. We love going to Uncle Eddie's house. Why? There was a, a big frame on the wall with the Queen, with, with King George V and Queen Mary in the middle, and like an oval around them, the Prince of Wales, the Duke of York, the Princess Royal at the top, and on the other side, um, the Duke of Kent and the Duke of Gloucester. And we knew that. And 1936, when, when uh, I didn't know where we got it from, but in 1936, when the King died, and they were talking about the Prince of Wales, I don't know who told us, but I remember with a group of us dancing down Lama Hall Street singing Edward Albert Christian George and Drew Patrick David. Edward Albert Christian George and Drew Patrick David. And those were the names of, I suppose, the Prince of Wales. We don't know where we got it from. And, and, and if you wanted to know, if you were a member of, of the, 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 the uh, we, 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 we recited, children of the empire, you are brothers all. Children of the empire, answer to the call. Let your voices mingle. Lift your hearts and sing. God bless their old England and God bless Britain's king. Children of the empire, your fathers fought and died that you might live a noble life in honor and in pride. And I can't remember the rest. Okay. <laughs> okay. It sounds like you were more indoctrinated than I was. <laughs> they didn't need to indoctrinate you in. <laughs> oh, you, got, you got the British connections already, I guess. Every 24th of May, every 24th of May, weeks before we were practicing. Oh, Empire Day, yes. Empire Day. Their land of hope, thy hope is crowned. God made thee mightier yet. Thy sovereign brow by love renowned. Once more thy crown is set. Thine equal laws by freedom gain, have ruled thee well and long. By freedom gain and truth maintain, thine empire shall be strong. And you get the drum roll with it. A land of hope and glory. Okay. And on that day, children, children gathered at the nearest cinema because the cinema was the only building that could have conducted up so many children accompanied by the British militia, the militia band. So when we got to the empire, the empire shall be strong. They have, you got the drum roll before you got into to, um, what you call it, land of hope and glory. My English friends only know land of hope and glory. They don't know the stanza, but we had to sing, we had to sing. And as, as um, you said, um, for in the new year in the World War II, the empire too we shall depend on you yeah that's always be in england <laughs> <laughs> yes there will always be an, and the, yeah and they depend on the empire that don't have nothing that is spitting on now <laughs> so, so the this, empire do too we can depend on you freedom remains these are the chains nothing can break yes that to do with links to the empire rather than slavery, I think. England shall be free if England means as much to you as England means to me. So that that was it. So so the, the, the indoctrination and it was the churches. You you, you got the, 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 the you were talking about uh, the, 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 the the songs we sang. Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Oh dear, what can the matter be? Johnny so long in the fair. He promised to buy me a bunch of blue ribbons. He promised to buy me a bunch of blue ribbons. He promised to buy me a bunch of blue ribbons to tie up my bunny brown hair. Look at my hair. <laughs> There's you a know, rude version to that, actually, but I won't. I, sing it. I was going to say I only know the rude version, and I think that's because my father liked rugby. <laughs> it's a very rude version. Bush, the mulberry bush, the mulberry bush. Here we go round the mulberry bush on a cold and frosty morning in British Guiana, with the sun shining every day. That's the mulberry bush. 
Yeah. So that's How really interesting. It stretches um, your imagination to imagine what a cold and frosty morning must be like. Uh, uh, Auntie Joyce, so can I just can I just interrupt you a moment? Um, there's somebody's got some background noise going on that I want to just get rid of. Oh gosh. Okay, so I had to mute all. So I'm sorry, Auntie Joyce, but you'll have to unmute yourself and so will Ian wish it some, uh, we're being, uh, uh, what do you call it? Zoom bombed by some dodgy uh, phone. Um, someone's got their hand up. Who's got their hand up? Christine, did you want to come in? Christine? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Hi everybody. I'm Christine. I'm actually based in Guyana. And okay. I, I'm I'm enjoying Auntie Joyce's songs and I, I'm so impressed by her memory and I can just I wish I can listen to her stories because I'm sure they're filled with so much um, relevance to even what's happening in the Caribbean currently because recently when the royal um visit in Jamaica, there was widespread protests because we really didn't, uh, you know, we don't really need them anymore. We don't need them to visit us. And because we we're independent, um, we're good enough on our own. We really don't need to be, I guess, romanticized anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think this whole thing of, of hierarchy as well. I mean, you know, this idea of monarchy being something that's real is, is, is very odd. You know, somebody just turning up and then expecting you to all, um, you know, feel some sort of honor by, by virtue of their presence. But yeah, certainly things have changed. Um, I wanted to um, just ask Ian, Ian do you, um, so did you have any strong memories um, of any any poems or songs or not particularly? It's, uh, I know Auntie Joyce has got this extraordinary memory. Well, I, I'm saying as far as British patriotic songs being a part of the national anthem, we all had to sing. Um, I can only remember, remember they'll always be in England. I don't know, certainly at, um, certainly at Queen's College, we weren't made to sing um, patriotic songs. Though I uh, had Master Nobbs, who was certainly, um, he was an Englishman, and he was certainly, I would say, he was an imperialist, but, um, you know, I, I, I can't remember many, many uh, patriotic songs being taught at school or... Um, but can you so. say something about maybe like Guyanese society? Because I always learned you know, obviously I, I wasn't brought up there. And so my, um, I'm always interested when I read books, they always talk about this kind of complexion hierarchy in terms of, you know, banks and civil servants. And, you know, was it still, did it still have that hierarchy when you were there? Oh, oh indeed, indeed. Especially in the commercial sector, not, not so much in the civil service. In the civil service, that's where a, a brighter um, a, a black person could probably get a, a decent job. But um, uh, certainly the banks would want to choose somebody of my complexion, and if not, maybe somebody of Chinese and um, so on. But of course, that, 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 all, that all changed. I mean, what, what were the, the uh, Caribbean saying about, if you're white, you're all right. If you're brown, hang around. If you're black, stand back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So... Yeah. Uh, uh, Auntie Joyce, do you, does that reflect your memories? Yes, it, it does. Yeah, but yeah, because when when the um, Americans came, when uh, during the war, when the Americans came to Atkinson Air um, Basile, Brown and Betty, the, it was all the poor people and the, 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 the white soldiers coming in. All the the, the, the front ones were the, were the Portuguese ones and the nailed whites. The black ones were making were cooking in the kitchen. Mm. And they, they wouldn't come to, you know, they wouldn't thank you. Um, f f Bookers and Fogarty's, um, they were all, and, and some of them, I had to say to one of them, when she turned up her nose on me, that if I didn't come and shop in her shop, she couldn't get a job. And what myself and Daphne, my friend, we used to do to them was, oh, they're so, you know, they think they're better than we were. 
so everything was fog. They had some place in Salem they call with all the shoes. And we would go in there and make her bring all the shoes down and try them on and then leave them. Walk out. <laughs> I, I, hear, I hear people do that. Yeah, because they were so, so snooty. Uh, yeah. They, read, they had nothing from it. And at, oh, the Bishop's High School in those days, darling. Yes. Iraqi, I mean, I got to Bishop's High School in 1940. The nearly was I, I won't I won't say the names now, but the nearly wise didn't have time for me. Yeah. Nothing from the neck up, but they was to boast that they were, oh I don't know. I must ask you, was it your sister? One used to boast that she went to Miss Richard's private school. Who is Miss Richard's private school? We didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's referring to Miss Hunter. Yeah, uh, uh, Mrs. Yes. Hunter, uh, right. yes, yes, but um because we had Richard to private it. school. It's private. Joyce is referring to certainly, well, mainly white. Um, there were a few like the Sharpleses and so on who were there who were, were sort of like brown. But um, we didn't know of who course, when it, um, it closed in 43, when my aunt got married, I but see. when it reopened in 54, it was completely different. If you looked at the photographs at the time, there was far more. E eclectic uh, admission then than, than before. So society was certainly changing. We heard about Miss Richard's private school daily. Yeah, Auntie Joyce, you know what? What I'm reminded of actually is um, Aleph Harewood, because I was asking her. She had come to um, the UK in in the uh, earlyish sixties, I think, around about sixty five just before independence. And she trained as an SRN nurse, hoping to go back to Guyana to work as a nurse. But then oh. when she got back to Guyana, she found out that she was locked out from nursing in Guyana uh, mm -hmm. on account of her complexion. So I just thought it was really interesting that even, even though they were at that point of independence, yes. she still had this kind of- um, You didn't have the right shade. You didn't have the right shade. Yeah. And, and so, um, it was, but as, as time, you now 1940 was like that. By the time the end of the war, you see um, the first black, the first black member at the British High School, or let us say, uh, yeah, and we had, we had like the, the preparatory people and Cicely Pilgrim, she had come back with a Montessori certificate. And she taught the, two, the, 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 the six, seven-year-olds at Bishops. But the first person who came back as a proper member of staff, by the time we got to the sixth floor, was Lillian Jure. She had won a Guyana scholarship and came back and taught us um, English and, and Latin in the sixth form. And this is where it began to change. Mm. And then people like Cecilia Francis went and she got a degree. And Mabel, uh, what was the name now? Um, Davidson, Clara Davidson went. And gradually, by becoming the end of the war, we weren't, they weren't coming back from England anymore. They were going home and not coming back. And eventually, the whole staff of Virginia High School became like an old girls' association. Mm. With the one white person was Mrs. Talon, who was the wife of the then Congregational Minister. But between 19, between 1939, up to, up to now, you, you know, it, it, it was difficult. Yeah. Um, Here it is. Uh, come, coming to back with But, but um, Aunt, Aunt Joyce, I'm just wondering because uh, what I find a bit puzzling is there's a lot of very successful Guyanese in that early 20th century period in, in terms of the UK. So think about people like um, Kenneth Snake Hips Johnson, Rudolf Dunbar, um, and Alice Fraser Denny. Oh, I mean, he knew, he knew Madam. Madam taught us singing. Right. So how how were they able to get so much international acclaim despite this kind of color bar? What was 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 it that because they were in music, you were allowed a certain I think music might have been a little bit more, you know, acceptable or you, you can, how 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 can you sort of um avoid a, a song? You know, a song hasn't got any skin color. You yeah. Say, but I was just interested because she was a cl classical, you know, because cl classical music was so key in Guyana that I just thought it was yes, interesting. But, no, the, part, yeah. the other person that people don't, but because she didn't become international, but the other person, you see, in those days, you had the Philharmonic Orchestra uh, with Dr. Bailey's wife, they had that. And Dorothy Tate taught, it, taught music at, at, at Bishops. And, and 
we were so English. We were singing, you know, um, A. A. Mills, um, Christopher Rowan had sneezes and weasels, they bundled him into his bed. We sang that. Vesper, little boy sleeps at the foot of the bed, leans on his little hand, little gold head. Hush, hush, whisper. Yes, Christopher <laughs> Robin is saying his prayers. <laughs> It's not, back it's not coming back yeah no i know and that's the interesting thing because even if it's not about monarchy it's uh, it's uh, the culture is just yeah, the culture was still european British at the time yeah i remember Aunt dorothy Aunt dorothy teaching us um schubert's the earth king who rides through the night if i'm so wild a father needs with his something child and at the end of it the child lay dead, and I can see her. We, we had to get that note correct. That was Schubert, but we know it was Schubert. She just taught us, yeah. but we know it was classical. We were saying "Give you joy of man's desiring," but we know it was just Bach. But she taught us. But to give her her due, we also learned to put on the skillet, put on the lid. Mama's going to make some shortening bread. You see, it's American now. It's not Guyanese either again. You know, yeah. you know. Let me just bring in um, Alexander the Great. Hold on, I just want to pin you. Uh, let me see if I can pin Alexander to. I... Alexander, were you talking? Alex... No, no, I'm I'm talking now. Can you hear oh, me? You are. Okay, I was just can trying to find. Now? Yeah, I'm just trying to find you on the screen so that I can try and pin there you. He is, there. Yeah, I can. I can hear. Oh, I'm fine with it. Adding a pin. There we go. There you are. Now I can see you. Yes. What 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 did you want to? I can't add? see me, but never mind. I can see. Um, I just need to change the view. If you have a look at the. Um, oh, there I am. I can see yeah, me. No, no, go. I can see me now. Yeah. I can see me. Yes. Um. Well, I wasn't born in Guyana. You all know that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> okay. We know, we know. <laughs> so this is a very interesting conversation. Um, fantastic, fantastic memory, Auntie. Um. Joyce. Joyce. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. I mean. I did, we didn't sing those songs. I was born in Trinidad, but I left Trinidad at the age of three. My parents came to England in, not, well, early 50s, either 51 or 52. I think it was late 51. And um, this was, in a sense, being, um, I mean, it's very funny. My cousins always refer to um, people coming in from outside as the foreigners. So they say, when the foreigners come for carnival, I say, Christine, we're visitors. I'm not a foreigner. I'm a Trinidadian. I'm just visiting home. But anyway, it's a funny sort of um, uh, concept they have there. And um, <coughs> it was, we kept in touch because relatives came to study here in Britain. And as you will, many of you will know, once you had a foothold here, relatives came in droves because you could, they could have a floor to sleep on or a couch or a fold down bed or something until they got themselves together. And four of my female cousins and three aunts came to Britain to study. Uh, Auntie Meg stayed here, then she just stayed here. She remained here. Um, the other three aunts went, two went back to Trinidad. No, one went back to Trinidad, two went to America uh, and got married and had families. And so we're very, very spread out. But the um, my school my school experiences, I also went to... Uh, I went to a wonderful secondary school. I went to a very good primary school at first, Strand on the Green in Chiswick in West London. And for reasons, well, I do know the reasons in a way. My mother, did, it, was, it wasn't a Catholic school and we were Catholic, and my mother was Catholic. She decided to send me to a Catholic school in Brentford. I have to tell you, it was the worst school in the borough. It was dreadful. It had, I think I was the only brown child in the school. It was run by a combination of nuns and um, a married couple called Mr. and Mrs. Clark, who really enjoyed wielding the cane. Oh, yeah. Um, we're oh. talking about nine, ten-year-olds having to put your hands out to be beaten with a, a, a cane on your hands. And, of course, apart from the fact that it's completely out of order these days, you never knew. I mean, I, be I became a musician. We don't know if you could have your hands damaged by being beaten with a cane. No one knows. So it was an interesting experience. And I think I had a teacher called Mrs. Elmore, and she did, now with hindsight, she did seem to pick on me more than any of the other kids. She found fault with me very, very often. When we had a school, the painting of the fence from Tom Sawyer, and you know, um, 
Jim is the young slave boy. I was cast as Jim. I had to come in singing Camptown Races. Oh, no. Nobody told me what the tune was. <laughs> so I just sang the Camptown Races, sing this song. Do da, do da. da. It wasn't anything like the tune because no one told me what the tune was. But um, another remembrance I have, which is interesting from the guy in his point of view, is that there was uh, every, every, well, on certain days in the school curriculum, you would, you at the primary school, you would listen to what was then the home service. And there were these 15 minute programs made for schools about 11 o'clock in the morning. One was called Time and Tune. It was about singing. Mm. One was called Music Movement. They would play various things and tell you to pretend to be a tree growing up or, um, you know, I don't know, maybe a snake crawling along the ground, these different things. But we learned there was a man who had a horse alum, had a horse alum, had a horse alum, was a man who had a horse alum down in Demerara. And that old man, he broke his leg alum, broke his leg alum, broke his leg alum. That poor man, he broke his leg alum down in Demerara. No one ever explained where Demerara was, what they Demerara know. was. They didn't know. It was just a song that we were taught to sing. They didn't know. To, to, to this day, when, the, when they tell I, I, I said, um, you all have Demerara sugar. Yes. yes. And then I quietly say to them, hmm. I was born on the west in my impeccable english i will say to them absolutely oh yeah bishop's high school you see pronunciation of the southeast of england i was born in a little village of stanley town on the west bank of the demerara river oh <laughs> in these days they don't know that's right yeah, they don't know. And I say, it's not Demerara, it's Demerara. Demerara, yes. So, so can I just ask all, all three of you, uh, starting with Ian, what were your childhood heroes? Who, who, who was kind of circulating in the ether at the time that you thought, yes, I... Well, I, yeah. I, 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 as a small child, obviously, as a during the war, obviously the, the hero was Winston Churchill. Yeah. It couldn't be anyone else. But... Um, I can't remember uh, necessarily having heroes. Possibly, I remember during my mid-teens, um, the guy, uh, he was a racing cyclist. I, I used to back Tarrant Glasgow. But, uh, I don't know why we back here. He brought here. a lodge with me. Uh, he hmm? a lodge. So he, he was a guy he cyclist? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. yeah. I knew him. He was a friend of my dad. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, so like, I, I remember we used to, the, the, other, the other big uh, cyclist was Laddie yeah. Lewis. Laddie we Lewis, always back yeah. Tarrant Glasgow against <laughs> Laddie, I don't know why. <laughs> but um, but so I couldn't there, really say I had childhood heroes. But uh, were there um, sort of uh, intra-territory intra games or anything like that? So between... Guyana and Trinidad and Jamaica and I mean was there any kind well, not, of not Jamaica Jamaica was far away yeah. Yeah. so just Trinidad and Guyana I, I, the, 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 the first time I saw a Jamaican was, my, was I think um, there were some Jamaican students at the Trinidad um, Imperial College of Tropical <laughs> Agriculture who during, during the vacation came down to Guyana I don't know whether they had something to do with sugar or what but I remember seeing them in, in, in Georgetown it was the first time I ever saw him at Jamaicans. The Trinidadians, Barbadians, oh yes, uh, because we were, we were quite close together. In fact, in, in the days du during the, towards the end of the war, when we were playing the triangular tournament at cricket, it was uh, Guyana, uh, Jama uh, Guyana, Barbados, and Trinidad, yeah. uh, not yeah. Jamaica. They were too far away. I mean, oh, yeah. Jamaica is as far yeah. west of Antigua as Antigua is north of, of Guyana. Mm. You know, it was... Well away from the rest of the um, uh, of the Eastern Caribbean chain. Yeah, <coughs> and Barbados seems to have been uh, uh, had quite a close link with Guyana. There's a lot of Guyanese, but Bayesian marriages and that kind of thing. So, uh, um, but I, uh, Auntie Joyce, I wanted to ask, who was your hero? Was it Winston Churchill as well? Oh, for crying out loud! No, thank you. <laughs> I just thought I'd throw that in there, Auntie Joyce. You see, it's a generational thing again. Um. Who was Winston Churchill? We, it's war. It's a war. You know, it's war. Yes, and we used to live. But no, I don't. 
he, would, he wouldn't have been our hero. We would know he was a very important man, um, but he wouldn't have been a hero for us because b before then, I wouldn't even call them heroes then. Well, f f figures yeah, that, that, hero that, that, you, yeah, that you admired maybe. Oh, so you like your teachers and people like Madam Alice Fraser Denny. Mm -hmm. You didn't say she was smiling, she was Madam Alice Fraser Denny. And at the end of the war, end of that Second World War, Madam put on a concert um, where my sister Ella, who went nowhere, was singing Let the Bright Seraphim, that Tirika Hama sang for somebody's wedding day. We were, we were singing that. And a, a lovely woman called Wilkinson from Babies was singing God Bless America. <laughs> and and another, cha another one, this, the Debedin girl, beautiful girl singing, oh, da, 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 da. but these were, and, and she, she, found, she got talent, she got talent from everybody and promoted them. The same with Auntie Dorothy Ted. Auntie Dorothy Ted ran the, film, the Philharmonic Orchestra and the Philharmonic Choir. And every year there was a concert at the town hall. Where we are singing, tis the last rose of summer, le blooming alone. Still British, but with, with, with Elaine singing that aria from Madame Butterfly. But we didn't know it was an aria from Butterfly. We just heard her singing it. Kidara, kidara, something, something, something. You know the famous aria from, from Madame Butterfly. So we sang these things. But nobody gave us the background. We didn't know that, that we were singing classical mu music. Mm -hmm. But 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 this was the, this was the cultural the cultural contribution. There was um this was Vestalo. Vestalo had a choir. There was a male boy, the, the police male voice choir. But they were except when they came, they started singing folk songs. But, but, I, you, but Auntie I, Joyce, can I, I ask you, because Madam Alice uh, Fraser Denny, yes. she, she um, was associated with Marcus Garvey. That's where she went away to America after. Yeah, but so her. what was the context? I mean, was there, were, did Haile Selassie play a role in Guyanese society? Oh, was, was he seen was as a... Very, there was something called the Negro Progress Convention. And she was very active in the promote. It was called, it was it was like to promote black people then. The in Guyana, was that in Guyana? Yes, in Guyana. Yes, NPC, right? And um, and 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 this is why. And there were two people at Vestalo and Charles and James Kidney. They were sent to Tuskegee Institute to, to for, like promotion for black people. And when Vesta came back, she opened um the the the. Frederick School of Home Economics for Girls, and James Kidney went into agriculture. But it was all like promoting Black people. And with Madame Alice Faze, Faze Genny providing us with the cultural side with the singing and the music. There was enterprise, uh, while, I, while I was taught English at the Bishop's High School, a man called, called Bertie Hart, whose parents were active in the NPC. When he opened the high school, Madame Alice Faze Genny taught, taught singing, and my sister was under my, I was under my, um, Auntie, Dor Auntie Dorothy Tate, and my sister was under Madame Malice Fraser Denny, singing Baccarole, Baccarole, you know, and, and, and so we got it, it was her, it was her, it was her, in, in, because of this NPC element of it, that was where it came from. But then even. So, Auntie uh, Joyce. Can I just ask as well, what was it in terms of the um, like Indo-Guyanese community, what was their position in society then? When all this is going on, were there no, any like really- No, Rajkumar, don't, um, you remember Rajkumari Singh? Rajkumari Singh was very active. They, they had an active, um, uh, what's called it? No, acting in acting. Right, come yeah. they had a joke. Yes. That's right, yes, yes. Yeah. Everybody knew what Gora. Don't you remember Kamtu Puran was Gora and everybody knew about Gora because he was he, he acted in this play. Uh, Raj Kumari Singh, they did very well, yes. So there were there were local people who, who were involved managed yes. to look yes. up to and admire. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Everybody knew Raj Kumari. Uh, her doctor was Dr. Singh, they lived on Ham on, on Lamaho Street. And you had the East Indian Association up Camp Road. So, so, so they had, they, they made input in, 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 into the cultural 
And, uh, and just before I, I move on to um, ask Alexandra a question, I just wanted to uh, uh, ask you one uh, additional question, Auntie Joyce, about the Amerindian community. What, what did people, I mean, what was the situation then with the Amerindian community? Was there much visibility of them in, in Georgetown? It was not until, I don't know for anybody else, but it was not until you became independent. Because at school dairy, I had to, and this is 1936, uh, Kingston Medley School, 1936 to, 36 to 39, we had to draw the map of Guyana putting in the Indian reservations. Mm -hmm. And they were still on the mines department. Mm -hmm. It's only till we became independent, really, that Amerindians came into their own. Okay, so so the Amerindian community remember, were really yes. kind of almost separate. You mean like the they were in reservations? Oriana, Macapo. My uncle Milton right. was at Kamakusa because they used to send the sick nurse and dispensers. The, the, the medical thing that the government had gave them were sick nurses and dispensers who went in there like like the Amerindian doctor. Wow, that's so interesting. Mm -hmm. Yes, so, so it was not until we became, and, and to think that they were, and if you wanted to employ one of them, you had to get permission from the Lands and Mines Department. Yeah, so um, can I bring you in, Ian, just briefly, you wanted to add to that? Uh, um, let's say the, you, you didn't, uh, the uh, Amerindians in my day were not visible um, in, in Georgetown, obviously. Mm -hmm. You had to go into the interior, but um, there were people that had, Amerindian ancestry, partly uh, at Queen's College, including um, a two second cousins of mine whose grandmother had been Amerindian. Their grandfather was Scottish. They'd married, and um, he had a he had a small estate up 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 the Deborah River. I never knew him because he died long before I was born. But um, and there was another one. Oh, can't remember his surname now. Who was part Amerindian, but. Um, you know, yeah, no, no, no one, no one who actually was a pure Amerindian. Mm. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes a lot of sense because there's a lot of, I know there's a lot of mixing historically between the Europeans and the Amerindians, so there would have been, yeah, it, it wasn't. It, like Wilson Harris's family, Yann Carew's family, you know, there's a lot of people famously who have um, Amerindians. Yeah, Diane Turk, I think, had slightly. Yeah, more. yes, very much so. Yeah. So uh, can I just come to Alexander? Alexander, because you you sure. you left Trinidad in, in when you were three. Who I mean, yeah. being at school in England, um, I'm guessing at the time that you were there, your most of the people in your school were white. Who yeah. would have yeah. been your kind of role models and or or heroes for you? Well, interesting, interesting enough. Um I said I went to a great secondary school, I went to Chiswick County Grammar School and it was fantastic with a fantastic headmaster, very forward thinking. And um, I, I enjoyed music, and, but I wasn't in one of the A streams. The A streams did music, uh, continue. everybody did music in the first couple of years, but it was extremely boring. We had a very, made us sing things like Green Grow the Rushes, though, and One Man Went to Mo and all that. Basically just fulfilling <laughs> his role to, it was an all boys school, you see, so, um, that they did music, but by the time we got to the third year, we had a great uh, Mr. Moss came down from um, Manchester. He was from the Northern College of Music, and he opened everything up. And the first thing he ever played us was "Take Five by the Brubeck Quartet. Oh, so yeah. imagine you you you're in this school where you think, oh, grown. We've, we've done two years of this kind of singing. What's this guy going to do? No, 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 first no, no. day back at school in September, and um, first music lesson, and he plays "Take Five. So it was a complete revelation to us. And we went on to do wonderful things. Um, I, my heroes, in a way, were more pop musicians because I was very interested in. Lucky enough, one of my aunties, Auntie Anne from Trinidad. Um, when she was here, uh, obviously, even though the nurses went to nursing uh, nursing homes and things, they would come to us for Sunday lunch and all that. So my aunties came around and everything. And this guy, um, Ed, um, what's his name now, Terry Masterson was a wonderful Irish folk singer who kind of um, fell for my auntie. He loved her. He, he, he thought she was gorgeous, which she was. But um, I was about 12 and he had a wonderful singing voice and, 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 and sung these wonderful songs. He taught me my first two chords on the guitar oh, um, okay. for, for an old Irish folk song. 
At the same time, I have to say that when people came over, they brought old, they brought LPs, vinyl, long playing records. Turn. Seven, so I would have been getting on for eight and a half by that time. We, uh, somebody came over, I think one of the girl cousins, with an album called Calypso Madness. And I was, although my mum sung a few things around the house, it never struck me. You've got to remember that particularly Trinidadian Calypsonians were very subversive. And I wasn't allowed <laughs> to sing some of the songs. No, they were wonderful. I mean, <laughs> when the Yankees came to Trinidad, the young girls were so very glad. They say the Yankees treat them nice and they give them a better price. Now, but a uh, rum and coca. Yeah, but, uh, and they give them a Kill better price. Kill the Yankee price. soldier. All of a sudden, <laughs> what does that mean, Daddy? Don't you worry about that. <laughs> Because when the when 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 the Andrews Yankees gone and Bravo take over now, Yankees, they're very nice. Oh, uh, make Trinidad a paradise. So it was all kind of toned yeah. down and and polished <laughs> up for the American market. And um, I was really interested in these things, particularly Gene and Dinah by by the great Mighty Sparrow by the Mighty Sparrow. Sparrow, so yes. Alongside of the pop music that was going on in England, I had this other stuff going on. I was really interested in it, but. At a certain point, I think it was 1960, well, obviously late 62, early 63, the Beatles hit and they hit big time. And the thing about the Beatles that we didn't know at the time, but we obviously later on we understood, was that they were singing black American music. Mm. They were singing stuff by Chuck Berry and by Little Richard, um, which we, was the, they were just the Beatles singing them, and Twist and Shout by the Isley Brothers. So I was very interested in this kind of, music much more so than people like Tommy Steele and even oh, Cliff yeah, Richard yeah. Mm. who were a bit too tepid for me. I, 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 I began to see that this this stuff anyway, to cut to the chase, um a West in a Trinidadian Calypsonian called Michael Goddard came to stay with us for a few certainly a couple of months, maybe three months, and he played Calypsos and I said to him, What do you think of the Beatles? And he said, Well they're okay. And I I was kind of excited. Don't you think they're wonderful? He said, Well they're okay. I said, what do you like to play? He said, I like to play Calypso. I said, really? He said, yeah, Calypso is much better. And you'll enjoy this. It was 1963 was the last year that the West came to England by boat. After that, they came by plane. Michael took me to Waterloo Station one day because he used to sort of, he, he knew I kind of, he was, he was perhaps my first idol because he was a musician who sang in a good voice and he sang, he played the guitar, all the things I wanted to do. And he lived in the house. Anyway, he took me to Waterloo Station, where there were hundreds and hundreds of West Indians sitting around in groups on, on you know, cushions or whatever they could find with lots and lots of Caribbean food no. serving out. And, and He's groups, right. groups of people, probably seven, eight, maybe nine, with a Calypsonian playing guitar and singing. So all around the station, you could find these little groups playing with someone singing Calypso. Um, some doing bottle and spoon, some doing just tapping on a, on, on a, on a you know, an old, um, a plastic, well, they didn't have plastic cup, a paper cup or a piece of cardboard or something to make a noise to welcome the West Indies team. And that was emblazoned on my brain as a fantastic event because, and I think actually mm -hmm. the British people, the English people were very surprised. They weren't upset. They walked around smiling, but they were quite bewildered by this huge outpouring of, of West Indians who were waiting for their heroes to come. Um, by 1963, yeah, 63 or 64, I think, Booker T and the MGs released their album Green Onions, and I was hooked because this was the grooviest music of early soul. Uh, in 1965, I visited the Hammersmith Odeon for the Stax Raid, uh, the Stax Roadshow, and the Stax Roadshow were Booker T and the MGs guitar, bass, drums, and organ. The Bar Kays, who were the three horn players, um, sax, trumpet, and trombone. Well, there may have been four, actually, Bar Kays. And then Sam and Dave, Arthur Conley. Um, who's the guy that did uh, Knock on Wood first? Anyway, um, and Otis Redding, topping the bill. And Motown came along, so I was really into all this wonderful black music that came in the middle of my school years. And I, <clears throat> I didn't really work hard on my A-levels. 
<laughs> which I was advised to do languages. My father was a German Canadian who met my mother at the University of Toronto because she went to study in Toronto from Trinidad. And they met there, fell in love, got married. I was conceived in Toronto. But mummy said, um, I want to go back to Trinidad to have my child in, in Trinidad. I want my child born home. So that's why I was born in Trinidad. And then they carried on after three years. I guess um, there was more opportunity. She was a teacher. He was a librarian. And um, they came to London to make their, their home there. So, as I say, um, I, I, I was advised by the school careers officer, oh, well, you should be doing languages because you've got a German father. You must be able to speak this. It, a, lot, a lot of us... I should have really done music at A-level, but I didn't then. <clears throat> so... When I left school after the upper six, I had one A level, which I passed, and two O level passes on the on the German and the French, which is not good enough. But I wanted so much to be a musician, I just wanted to get out there and do it. And Daddy said, "Oh, but what about going to college?" And my mother, my wonderful mother, said, "Give him a chance. Let him do it what he wants to do first, because he'll either do something with it or he won't, and then he'll get it out of his system and see what happens." Anyway, I did every job I could um, in order to buy my equipment. I worked at um, Radio Rentals, not a very nice job. I had to send out nasty letters to, to, to people who hadn't paid their, their, their rentals. Their <laughs> oh, yeah, no, no. <laughs> then, Bush Murphy, which sold TVs and things. Um, Canada Dry, loading up trucks with, with fizzy drinks and things. Inecto Hair Dye Factory in Brentford, where I sat on an assembly line putting, um, you know, you, you hold it and you move to the next bottle and it squirts the, you name it but anyway <clears throat> by the time I was about 21 I was fairly self-sufficient and playing music playing organ and gigs and things um because my mother had sent me to Sorry, what, what year are we in now we're now talking about course, 19, 1968 1969 okay 69, course, I went on tour with a band a black band called Noel and the Fireballs um there were it was saxophone guitar bass drum two girl singers and a lead a male lead singer and we did the german um military basses so we were singing we were doing soul music and a little bit of ska it wasn't really reggae quite yet reggae was to come in more early 70s but it was ska blue beat and um as i say king curtis these uh, and, and things like motown and things like that so it was but always at the back of my mind, I always kept two or three Calypsos in my back pocket, as it were, in case Calypso should come up. And I sort of kept in touch sporadically with what was going on back home um, through the people that called. So I had an awareness of this this music that I subsequently ended up doing in, in the 90s. I decided I was going to go back to my roots and become a Calypsonian. Interesting. A film came out called... Um, the Tommy Steele story. Any of you remember Tommy Steele? Do you know who Tommy <laughs> Steele is? I remember. Very, very big in the early days. Yeah. Right. And so he did the Little White Bull was the big hit he had from um, to Tommy the Toreador was the film. But anyway, the, 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 the story, the Tommy Steele story, all the scene changes in it were done by a Calypso singer. Now he was... What was his name? He ended up on EastEnders. In not, I'm not talking about. Um, not Idol. Somebody Idol. Yeah, something like that. Oh, it's very I, similar. I, yeah, I think I know. Tommy Idol. It was Tommy Idol. Tommy Idol. Right. Yeah. Tommy Idol. Who is the guy? Idol. A guy a English film about a white pop singer because it was only <laughs> pop music really, doing all the links with a little, you know, was playing a guitar and, and singing a couple of verses. That moved you into the next scene of the story. So Tommy so it was interesting. My, um... It shows how big Calypso was yeah, yeah. in the fifties in Britain. It really was. People forget. Remember, there were only TV, two TV channels: ITV and BBC. So you watched one or the other. So at any particular moment, you would see a lot of people watching. Cy Grant, famous Guyanese actor, war hero, shot down over Holland. Um, he spent time in uh, his prison of war camp, and um, that he wanted to do. He, he trained to be a lawyer, but because of the the, uh, the the bad feelings still in, or not bad feeling, but the racism that was 
always in here. Yeah, the racism never kind of let people. It do never let people. Why they let ER Brathwaite training to be a physicist and having exactly. To but but the thing about Cy was yeah. they gave him a job doing a little roundup at the end of the week on the Cliff Mitchellmore show tonight on TV. Mm. So ten million or twelve million people would see him on a weekly basis singing this little song around he, he actually quit in 1960 because he didn't want to become typecast but there again is a story of so that's my influences backgrounds of this music that i knew i belonged to but i was kind of it wasn't anything wrong with playing the american stuff it's a case would it be um, a and so on this very interesting yeah. mixed You know, it's a case of these children of the, um, you know, what, what, what is the, um, I always think of the unintended result of this colonization. Yes. That you learn the poems. I mean, you were reading, you were, you, even, even though it was a West Indian reader, at the back of the West Indian reader, all the poems were by, by people like Tennyson and uh, uh, that, that yeah, you didn't know yeah. those famous ones. But and, and so the, the unintended the unintended result or consequence of this was that we turned out to be a highly educated population. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. The unintended. The unintended. The, the, I mean, uh, 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 unintended consequence was colonization in reverse. It was the unintended result. The unintended result of this indoctrination or this yeah. what you call it. The, 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 you, you are so British, British, British. Look, this West Kenyan reader at the back of it, the poems is is um Stevenson, John Ruskin, William Shakespeare. This is West. In, this is a West Kenyan reader, but these are the poems, <laughs> right? Let's just say Sidney Oliver. This one here, um. Alan Cunningham, John Mansfield, we all we all recited. I must go down to the seas again to the greatest sea in the sky. Uh, yeah, right. Look at here, sea fever. Um, Judge, Judge Parry, J. C. Squire, and we all sang. I vowed to thee, my country, by by somebody named Spring Rice. I used to say, but he got a lot of rice in his mouth. We didn't know it was a double bar name. The, there was a naughty boy, and the naughty boy was he. I run away to, they didn't even tell us. The funny thing was, we used to, we used to rap it. Rap it was, there was a naughty boy and a naughty boy was he. He ran away to Scotland, the people there to see, then he found that the ground was as hard as the, as the song was the very, as bright as it. And he stood in his shoes and he wondered, he wondered. He stood in his shoes and he wondered, John Keats. Nobody told us that John Keats at the bottom of the thing was the man who wrote the poem. We thought it was the last line of the. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And I used to wait. You went to syncopate it. So he stood in his shoes and he wondered. He wondered. He stood in his shoes and he wondered. John Keats. <laughs> <laughs> it was not until I got to the sixth form yeah. and we were doing, and we were doing when all day shall this generation with thou shalt remain with this of of miss of honor, beauty is true, true, true beauty. This is all you know or not. I said, oh my God, it's the same man who wrote that, who read the, 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 yes. No, nobody told us, but all at the back of, each at the back of this, of the West Indian readers. It's, 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 it's English authors. Mm. So this can I, um, I, 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 just, I just wanted to ask um, Ian, Ian a question about moving to uh, Britain. So Ian, when you came to, to, to England, did you find, um, did you experience any kind of prejudice based around your accent, for example, or, or do you sound so English that the English didn't notice? I'm just wondering, because like, you know, um, Jean Reese, you know, the, the, the uh, yeah, writer Jean Reese yeah. Yeah, from Dominica used to talk about how she would be treated differently because of her accent, even though she well, was wise. Didn't have an English accent, yes. They, they, they used to think I was Welsh. Yeah, yeah well, I was going to say, there's a little track. Remember, the, between the Welsh and the Scots and the Northern English and the West Country English, there are so many accent changes anyway. Yeah. But the Welsh, so nobody thought that, that you were been... from um, Guyana or... Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, I used to tell them where I was from if it was, if it was asked, but uh, I, I can still remember uh, it was an evening at um, a Trinidadian who was... Uh, Well, he became quite a prominent Trinidadian, Ken Julian, 
Um, he was in my year at no Nottingham University. He did electrical, I did mechanical. And, um, but he'd been there a year before because he did an intermediate year. And um, he took me to the, oh, he must come to the International Society. So I went to this meeting of the International Society where you had the minuscule glasses of sherry they used to give you in those days. And uh, this English undergraduate girl said, where are you from? I said, British Guyana. She said, oh, that's in Africa, isn't it? I said, oh, oh, God. I said, no, it's in the northeast coast of South America. She said, oh, no, it's New Guinea that's in Africa. I said, no, that's an island north of Australia. And that was the end of the conversation. <laughs> I knew there is a Guinea in Africa, but uh, you know, New Guinea, she said. I thought you were going to say that she thought you were saying Ghana for a minute. Oh, there was no Ghana then. Yeah. Oh, of course. Ghana came up um, in my second year. No, in my final year, I think, 57. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, it was Gold Coast. So, so um, I'm trying to think because when when you came to England, then um, that was before independence. Yeah, that, that was yeah when I was a student. So, but when so, I came, when I left Guyana, um, it was in '62. When I after I went back for three years and came back here, it was '62. So it was uh, it was before independence anyway. So uh, I, I wasn't I wasn't but, there but, for. But how much how um how much of a build up was there towards independence? I mean, was there a lot of uh, discussion in in the press and were people? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, yes, there, there, there was. There um it, it was obviously we, we were going that way. Um, there was no. Uh, but was was everybody kind of in support of it or? It was a, it, 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 it's where you had the parties there, the People Progressive Party. Mm. Yeah, it, it, yes. remember the People's Progressive Party split in what, around about... Um, 62, 60, 60, 60, early 60s. 67. Yeah. After, but, after, um, after, the, um, after the Constitution was suspended. Yes, but not directly. Until 57. They had they had the interim government until... Yeah. And then said... And they came back in at, at, at that time I was at university, you see, between yes. 54 and between 54, um, people, yes. and early 59, I came uh, yes. went back to Diana. Yeah, um, um, that is when the split began. Yeah, right. And I, I, I knew about it. Yeah, we first heard about Go on. No, you said it. No, the point is that was the only time we until <laughs> My good friend, we used to go to extramural classes. And one weekend, I won't say her name, um, but she she was she came from a very prominent fa family. And she came to me one weekend and said she'd been to, to this party that was for well, until then, the, my only idea of a party was a pretty dress, a pretty dress with a can can skirt, and you're going to and hold this boy dance with you. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only party I knew. And she's telling me how she's doing this work for this progressive party. And, and how this Janet Jagan has come and so, and I said to her, this, this American white lady had come, was married to, to Jenny Jagan and then born and whatever it is. And I'm saying to her, but what is it that she has for, for my country that she wants to come fight my country for me? This white American woman, what is it for her? And I, I and I said to her, no, I don't want to have anything to do with that. I was teaching sixth standard at Trinity School. I said, I will teach my boys and I will tell them something, and then we'll do it. Eventually, um, she she uh, this is interesting. She, eventually, she she was engaged with a chap who is in America, and in those days you had to have an um, you had to have a visa, and you had to go to a Trinidad. And she came to me in a funk in the day and said it, it, a terse letter asking her to give her political ac action between such and such a date. They had checked her out. And we had, to, we, we had to sort of frame a letter to say that we were young and we heard these people are doing this thing. But, and when we found out, she, 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 she didn't continue her, her um, membership. And that's how they gave her a visa to go to. to. So this is when we were beginning to realize that politics was, was a difficult Thing. Then you had these 
then the first time we heard about universal adult suffrage, one man, one vote. We didn't know about that um, before because for you to get in the legislature, we didn't even know about who was governing. You know, they had a man named John Fernandes was in the LegCo and you had to have um, property. It, it's property you have to have to become a member of the Legislative Council. So we, your salary. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So, so ordinary people like us, we only know about the government. We didn't know about <clears throat> how it, it was done until you had, every, the, the other word that came into was a manifesto. Everybody putting out a money, what was a manifesto? These are words that were coming to us. And we, and myself and Sybil Patterson, we all, th these were days when she was Chedi and Odo and Chedi and Odo and Chedi and Odo. They would have meetings on um, parade ground, border ground, border, border ground, and at, at the corner of um, Crown and Albert Street by, by Twins Drug Store. There was, Brindy Ben was there then. And Brindy Ben telling us what the command, the commanding high of the economy, I had a clue what it was about, but we got a vote for them. And I think they say it was Brindley Ben who coined the, the one man, one people, one, what's it? What's the new, the new thing? One man, one people, our, one our one new one motto. One, one people, one nation, one destiny. Yes, I think they said it was Brindley Ben who, who, who coined that. So we were all involved. Sidney King, uh, and then people like, I think Rory, because we were on the fringe, we were not in the middle of it. You're only hearing all these people. But then we all voted. P we all voted um, PPP yeah. in nineteen fifty three. I think what you're saying is really interesting because um, <laughs> you wrote that really long piece, which I must share at some point about the relationships you had with the Indo Guyanese community and how close they were. And we, I did not, we did not know anything about race unless only bicycle race and horse race. Race was not enough. <laughs> bicycle race. Race and bicycle race we knew. Yeah. Eric, um, Eric Hunt will tell you that, it, 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 that when they live in Boston and the midwife, and the midwife is late and his neighbor give his wife the, the, the thing to bite and cut, the, and cut the neighbor's tree. Till the, till the neighbor. She said, I said, what was her name? He said, but we didn't even call her name. You know she was neighbor. In Kingston Methodist School, my best friend is also go to Saul, Indian. Bishop's High School was Patsy Wong, and then I'm the Sankar. I'm the Sankar Muslim, I'm the Sankar Muslim. She's to be says a Hindu. It didn't, it didn't occur to us that we were different. My mother's a midwife, and Mrs. Singh, where she was living was it so good. Nurse, can I come to your house and have my baby? My mother was a, was a woman who couldn't tell no to anybody. <laughs> you know, she did not say no. So Mrs. Singh came to our house and had her baby. It didn't work, it, you know, it, it, it didn't work. My auntie Bruna would go to Mousy and say, in those days you come by Cordelia's chops. When we go to Mousy, she would come out, it was like a ritual. She would buy the masala and she would buy the thing and she put it in a bowl. And she, she so graciously, graciously put this bowl in my hand to take to my auntie Bruna. That's the curry, because you come, you come by curry in the shop those days. We didn't have that. But it politics. Well, I think, Joyce, you're talking about um, among the educated middle class. But no. if you go down to the basic Indian and, uh, and black no. working class, no. you would have seen friction. But it because by the time your generation came, you got friction. You can take yeah, a generation. I think... Thing, I think um, I, 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 I've just put in the, um, Auntie Joyce, bear with me a second. Auntie Joyce, bear with me a second. I've just put in the in the chat a link, <clears throat> which is worth um, everybody having a look at if you have time. It's about 30 minutes long, but it just basically talks about how the British, um, in the build up to the elections, created this kind of split between the Indo and African community. I wouldn't be surprised. And, and um, yeah, I just think it's really interesting because I think, I think for me, maybe, I mean, maybe this is just me being a, a bit romantic about it, but it'd be useful in terms of Guyana kind of getting over these kind of uh, the racial divisions that sometimes uh, occur, particularly in, in the political arena, if they were taught 
this kind of history about the British involvement in creating the split in the first place. Um, so there's a, there's a, yeah, I mean, I didn't want to show it now because I, I, I think it's a really, <clears throat> that whole discussion around what happened in Wismar in 63 and so forth is a very contentious um, issue. But I think if we can gain some understanding of how it all, the build up to all, everything that happened, um, maybe that's something that could be used towards healing uh, Guyana, but anyway, that's a that's a separate um, that's a separate thing. I actually at this stage, I wondered if we could have a song. So um, Alexander de Grey, oh. please, would you share sure. a song? With okay, us? now um, I did a gig on Friday night, just gone, just to explain. I I, I played in Reading for um, Admiral Jack is one of the Calypsonians in Britain. He's from he's from um, Barbados, and he's been putting a calypso tent on for the past twenty years, which he does. You know, I mean, a shoestring budget, really, and a lot of goodwill. And um, because of the little bit of success, the little flash in the pan bit of thing of my, my appearance recently for the song I'm going to sing, everybody been saying, OK, but I am known, as you know well, Juanita, um, for social and political commentary, right? Yeah. And I've written a song for the Queen's... In fact, I wrote it 10 years ago. I wrote a song for the Queen's Diamond Jubilee, and I did a little recording of it with acoustic guitar, and some children, year six children, that's 10 year olds from my son's primary school at the time. Um, and I was asked to re to look at it again for this particular um, um, jubilee by uh, the, the BGT team. So I did it. And everyone last night, oh, Friday night, somebody came to me and said, what happened, Alexander, you sell out or what? And I'm going to get more of that because <laughs> I say this advisedly, people who don't see the bigger picture will always find a reason to find something to have a go at you about, and there will be more of them. So I wrote this song, it may seem to be out of character, but the fact of the matter is, I have no problem with the Queen. I may have problems with other members of the royal family, and the concept and the past history of the royals and all the rest of the things that go on, but... This song is simply me wishing a venerable old lady a happy birthday and for her achievement in becoming the longest living ever monarch of Britain. It's called Big Party for Your Platinum Jubilee. Enjoy. Queen Elizabeth has reigned for so many years over this green and pleasant land. She has smiled, and I'm sure that she has shed some tears For reasons we can all understand The year of accession, 1952 She took on this responsibility She has set the style for the longest while Of just how elegant royalty can be Commonwealth wants to drink your majesty's health Celebration of our worldwide community Let's have a big party for your platinum jubilee Everybody wishes your majesty Health and happiness of the very best All around this world people are saying God bless So let's have a big Party for your platinum jubilee and God bless your majesty. As young Princess Elizabeth, she joined the guides and won the children's challenge shield. She loves art, music, theatre, and equestrian rides. A fine horsewoman, the queen has always been. Residing at international functions with dignity She's patron of many an organization With a host of engagements annually Including meeting the odd politician She is kept informed daily of the state of the country And the charities for which she has such a passion Yes, let's have a big party for your platinum jubilee. Everybody wishes.
health and happiness all the very best all around this world people are saying god bless let's have a big party for your platinum jubilee and god bless your majesty while on tour the princess heard of her father's failing health and finally that the king had passed on she became queen of great britain and the commonwealth and she took on what had to be done she has seen so many prime ministers come and go in some big changes along the way long as the world seems to ebb and flow she still does her duty anyway to show our appreciation we're having this celebration and we wish your majesty a wonderful day hey yeah let's have a big party for your platinum jubilee everybody wishes your majesty health and happiness of the very best all around the world people are saying god bless so let's have a big Party for your platinum jubilee and long live your majesty. Why, why, why? Big party okay. jubilee and God bless your majesty. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> wonderful. That was absolutely Thank you. Wonderful. Thank exactly you so much. Um, I feel like I need I need to uh, ask Ian to do something now. And get, Ian, uh, you, you don't want me to sing, I hope. <laughs> well, I don't want you to sing, but can you tell us the joke about the railway? Is the gentleman on the railway. Joke about the railway? Yes. The ice, the ice. Oh, oh that, that one, I haven't remember. Oh, oh yes, um, some of the great panjandrums of, of Georgetown. So Eustace Wolford, and I think probably Johnny Adams and so on. Holiday, holiday Monday, they were going up to New Amsterdam on the train and they were knocking back their booze and they ran out of ice. And they asked the guard if there was any ice in the train. He said, I can see what I can do, sir. Hold on. He came back with ice. Oh, so they had the ice going up, you know, past my Coney, getting into um, getting into Babis now. Ice run out again. Got another one. Ice get yeah, the Belladrum, Litchfield, Fort Wellington. Ice low. All the guards. God says, sir, if I bring any more ice, the body can spoil. <laughs> <laughs> Did you get that, Alexander? Yes, but there was some interference from somebody making some noises there. Can you yeah, yeah. Not, no, the body gun spoil. The ice was from a corpse. We were carrying on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, I I love I just love that joke. But we had um, we had a, a Zoom bomber who was trying to yeah. uh, interfering with the sound in the background there. Unfortunately. Oh my. I don't know how they get on, honestly. I'm trying to see, like, how do these people get on here? Oh, but they're like hackers, aren't they? They're just a nightmare. Um, Auntie Joyce, do you want to sing us out with anything? Oh, I don't know. What shall I sing? There's so many things they taught us. Oh, uh, no, <clears throat> no. This is, if this is, um, in spite of being children of the empire, and we've been brought up to the empire, the Reverend Holy Brian was the one man who wrote the word. Hang on, hold on a second, Auntie Joyce. Bear with me. I just need to get rid of this person. I know who they are. I'm just going to get rid of them. Who wrote the words and the music of what we consider our unofficial national anthem? And so while we, even though they were telling us that we were children of the empire, I think the Reverend Holy Brian, white, but he became such a Guyanese, I tell you, that when he died, there was a riot almost when they, when they were deciding to, to bury him in a repetition ceremony. We want to be passed in the churchyard. Look, I carry there, we want to hear. And they had to bury him 
in the churchyard. Born in the land of the mighty Rorai, land of great rivers and far stretching seas, so like the mountain and the river, great, wide, and deep, and our lives would we be. Under the top, you need to teach us the words. At least we each of us may show what Guyana can and be. So to this land which God has given, may our young heart bring up gift rich and rare. So as we grow, may the group of Guyana shine with the step that beyond all compare. Onward, upward, upward. upward. <laughs> Strength and beauty grow. Strength and beauty grow. We each of us we show what Diana sons and daughters can be. Of course, of course, the school children had their own version. Oh, yes, we know that. <laughs> <laughs> I take it it wasn't uh, it wasn't a polite version, Ian. No, it was, it's quite polite. So, Onward, upward, uh, Mary on, had a book. Yeah. Day by day, she tied it with a rope. <laughs> till at last, the goatee bust the rope, and Mary had to run behind oh, it. I Sorry, um, Joyce. I keep saying that this was the unintended, the unintended result of colonialism until the, the beginning of the, the, the war until 1944-46. English it's, literature? It's, it's very it, interesting, Auntie Joyce. It because of me. We got a fabulous education, a fabulous English yeah. education that, that is, is the, the, the envy of our English counterparts of the same period. I, I think it's really interesting, Auntie Joyce, yeah. though, because um, when I think of Guyanese of your generation, they're extremely well educated. Yes. But when I look at the flip side here in the UK, yes. Yes. Like the ESN schools and everything that West Indian children were subjected to. They, they, couldn't, they, couldn't accept the, they couldn't accept, I mean, in spite of proof positive, they really couldn't accept it to be so well educated. Mm. I've had it when I taught, when I taught at Scott Legion. Yeah. You know, I had to I had to sort of remind one or two of them because when I got there, they didn't know where I had come from. Mm. It's a it's a, it's a man's it's a boys' school. The whole staff were men except for one other woman. I didn't tell them what my background was, but some little twerp that had just come out to training college wanted to tell me how much teacher class. Mm. I had to tell him as a boy when I left Guyana, I was acting principal of a government training college for teachers. And our, our standard was so high, I don't think you could have got a certificate from me. Mm. And that finished him. Mm. Because you're, were... you're reminding me, actually, Edgar Middlehauser writes in, in, in a private oh. memoir when he was in the uh, Trinidad Volunteer Royal Naval, the Royal Naval Voluntary Reserve. Reserve. Yeah. Um, when he was there, he was on board a ship with other white English seamen and he was saying, uh, uh, naval officers, and he was saying that they used to get him to write letters home for them. Exactly. They yes. were so illiterate, yes. he used yes. to write the letters for them. Yes, um, I had a couple, I had a couple living in this cul de sac. It yeah. took them about 10 years to recognize that I was here. <laughs> then yeah. eventually they invited me in and got, we got talking. And one said to me, oh, they had a daughter called Pip. And I said, my family name being Pirup, my Christian name being Philip, my infant town cannot more, can say not more ex explicit of these two, but Pip. And so I called myself Pip and came to be called Pip. As my mother would say, Yakukuya Sars, they hadn't a clue what I was talking about. <laughs> the first the opening lines, of great expectations by Charles Dickens. Mm. And we were saying that because it was in the West Indian reading book and we used to say, Pip, 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 Pip. It was the opening sessions mm. of, of great expectations and one of these was the new readers. Yeah, yeah. I but, I, but I think the 
Guyanese were definitely more educated than the average British person. Was. I tell you why. So, I tell yeah. you why. Mm. Because I, the British had complete uh, compulsory education in 1870. We had compulsory education in 1876. Mm. And I remember the days when the attendance officer would go to houses to find out why the children were coming to school. Mm. Mm. And except for Barbados, we were next. Because if you went to Barbados, you learned Latin and Greek in, in grammar school. We only learned Latin. Mm. Grandfathers, they, they learned Greek, but I don't know when it was stopped. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you went to Harrison College in Barbados, it was Latin and Greek. So, so let me ask all of you then, if you were to say, where was home? Where is home? Ian, where is home and why? I'm a Guyanese born resident in England. <laughs> okay, Auntie Joyce, uh, yeah. Guyanese born and resident in England. Okay, right. Ian, yeah. what about you? Oh, and I would have to say home is here now, because I mean, I've lived here most of my life. And I'm certainly not going back to Guyana at the age of eight to seven. Eight. <laughs> right. I know I'm not a non-Nigerian non -Nigerian yet, but if you call her Auntie Joyce, why, why am I not Uncle Ian? You are, you are Uncle Ian. You are. You're All right. I actually call Auntie Joyce Auntie Joyce because she's born on the same day as my mother. Um, <laughs> she shares, she shares a birthday with my mother, so yeah. I kind of adopt her as my mom. Home is where, you, where your family are. Yeah, yeah family well, that's where it is. Are. That's where my family are. But I, but I do think you're allowed yeah. more than one home. I mean, I, I feel like yeah. I have yeah. several homes. So I think a bit... Yes. Like, because when I go home, I say I'm coming back home. Yeah. So, 11 Sunday, no gardens, you know. Uh, uh, Alexander, what about you? Well, you, you I, I, of... I would say my home is here in Britain because I've lived... Still called going back to Trinidad, going home. Because no. lots of my family are there. I mean, um, my uncle, one uncle, one aunt, and my mother came to Britain. Um, the rest of them, apart from two aunts who went to America, stayed in Trinidad. And I have lots of cousins, and we have children. And some of us have grandchildren. I have one grandchild, but others have more. And so Trinidad is still the, the sort of nucleus of where we all meet up. And it's great. When I go home to Trinidad, there's always a big gathering with all the food and the... And it all talk, as we say, and um, it's a great deal of fun and exchanging of stories of past uncles, aunts, grandma, grandpa and all of that. It's um, there's so much. I think the thing about the way we as as is that we have so many other influences in our backgrounds. My grandfather, my Trinidadian grandfather's name was Kelly. My grandmother was named Devonish. The Devonishes came from Northern Ireland, from Inniskillen, um, and they were Catholics who fled the um, the Orange Men, if you like, to Trinidad. Um, it's a it's a very vast and and sort of um, you know distributed. There's lots of little backgrounds in our backgrounds. Yeah. And I, I call when people say I call myself an Earthling. <laughs> I'm from Planet Earth, and I have lots of different strains of background which i'm very pleased and proud about i mean the irish blarney is in there somewhere so is the spanish so is the french um, de la bastide was i know there's all these mixes in that and that makes us very international and very universal i think more so than perhaps people who only have one or perhaps you know one and a half yeah. lines of a background people who, i find that there are certain people think oh my family goes back 500 years Big deal. Everybody's family goes back 500 years and we wouldn't be here. So, you know, when you say you're proud to be um, from one strain, that's no big deal. It doesn't impress me. When you think about it, you have two parents, four grandparents, eight great grandparents, 16 great great. It doesn't take long to get to 500. About 10 generations will take you to 500 influences. And if all those people have their own story to tell, then we're all pretty mixed. So, um, as you say, home is where you find yourself. Home is here with my. Um, children. Like, Although, actually, having yeah. said that, my son's still here. My two daughters at the moment are living in America, yeah. in different parts of it. So, you know, we just travel. I remember at school going to Boulogne on the north coast of France for a day trip. And it was the biggest, you can, can't imagine, it was like going to the moon to get on a boat in the morning at the age of 12 and get to the other side and then come back at the end of the day. Now they just jump on a plane and head off to Australia at the drop of a hat. 
it's so easy you know it's all kind of um, it's very very different but I, I, I have no regrets I've enjoyed it and also I forgot to say earlier on um, my father's wishes were granted because after I went um, I became a professional musician I started I went to a foundation a level did a foundation course and I got more interested I did a level music then I got more interested I wasn't intending to and then I ended up going to Dartington College of Arts in Devon and doing my music degree and then a postgraduate certificate of education back in London University which I used a little bit I did it because I wanted to know what I, I wanted to learn and the place to learn is in a university or a college um, I became a teacher for a very short time about a year went back to playing regularly and now I do workshop for the last 20 something years I've been doing workshops in schools where I teach Calypso writing to whole classes something that Trinidad has not yet adopted I'm rather annoyed about it. I've been to them I've talked to the government about it and said you know um, there's a way of if you want to in increase a you should have whole classes in school studying the history and trying to write as a group because it's the experience of, 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 of composing that gives you that that feeling for it but they won't see it and so funnily enough in this home in England as far as I know I'm the only person doing that kind of work and I've been doing it for a long about 22 years now so um, more than that actually 23 years so um, it's interesting that you mentioned the Irish earlier though because I've always thought yeah. that there's a there's a kind of similarity between the Irish because and the, of the way they were treated exactly yeah. no and Irish it, no dogs no blacks yeah but also just in terms of, if you go to Ireland yeah. the music they love to play music and their music is quite often um, subversive as well yeah, yeah. Of course. kind of Absolutely. similarity between the calypso and and yeah. kind of I, you know, I always think that's actually really interesting. Yeah. Listen, it's it's getting to quarter past five. I'm just conscious I'm holding everybody. Yeah. Uh, Hear this last one. Yes, Auntie Joyce. When Alex Haley was doing Roots. Remember when Alex Haley was doing yeah, Roots? Of course, yeah, 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 yeah. I had to watch it because I have a class of white boys. And the next morning, they, they, I'm going through a third degree questioning, asking me about, and Miss Watterson, Miss Watterson, and you think he's here. So I quietly said to them, brown as I am, I've got a mixture of several races, and I told them what it was. Oh, Miss, they said, liquor is all sorts. Liquor is all okay. <laughs> yeah, and I told them, I say my, my, my grandmother was half Asian, half this. On my father's side is black and African and white, and I said, oh, Miss, liquor is all sorts. Well, it, 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 it's, it's same, sorts. same yeah. with me. I mean, you look mm. at me, but grandfather wishes was obviously with somebody about Rod's complexion, maybe a bit fairer. Yeah. And um, okay, his wife Gaini is white, and um, you know, who, but on my mother's side, her mother was half Indian from India, because evidently grandfather, my mother's father, who was much who was, who was much older than my paternal grandfather, because my mother was the the the, the thirteenth of fourteen children, and he only wow. got married when he was in his forties. And he, he must have been recruiting indentured labor for the sugar estate because he was sugar estate manager in India. And he married, a, 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 well, in those days, they called him Eurasian lady. But I never knew her because she died when my mother was, um, was only 13. But um, so we, we, we're, we're all mixed up, however. Much we, yeah, yeah. Know. We all licorice all sorts. Yeah, we're all licorice all sorts. I, I think I, I think Rod's got every every ethnic race in Guyana except for Chinese. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, 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 don't, well, I don't have Amerindian. I don't have Amerindian um, part Amerindian cousins, but. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, just thank you so much to you, Ian and Alexander and Auntie Joyce. That's really fantastic. I'm going to, um, I don't know if the audience want to um, ask any questions or make any comments or share any of their stories. Um, we could go to 5.30 at the latest, I think. But um, just in case, uh, Ian and Alexander, Auntie Joyce, if you had other things you need to rush off, I don't know. I just want to check with you. Okay, no? for the moment. okay, so um, let's just see if there's any questions or comments in the chat. Apart from apologies, by the way, for the disastrous beginning because we were having such problems. Oh, this technology, technology, this technology was just driving us crazy. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, so David Chung says, as children, we were inculcated into empire through the visits of royal members. I can recall the visit of Princess Margaret and the euphoria of that visit. I was not enthused by the occasion. What was all the enthusiasm about? <laughs> um, and, and also just because what's so fascinating talking about this is thinking about the recent visits to the Caribbean, you know, with um, William and, and Kate, and of course, yeah. it's actually Edward shocking. Edward. Uh, sorry, uh, uh, and Edward and uh, Sophie, yeah. uh, that they just thought that they could rock up in the same kind of manner as they had done in the past and there wouldn't be a reason. They don't know Master Day done. They don't know Master Day done, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, so, Master Day done. <laughs> they done. So yeah, Auntie Joyce, everybody's commenting on your memory. I think we're all very jealous of your memory. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't remember it. I did remember so much because it just comes, you know. Yeah. I come, it's so vivid. Yeah. You're very lucky. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Rahana was mentioning, she just said the color hierarchy very much existed way into the 60s. In the banks, the Chinese, Portuguese, and people of lighter skin were much more prevalent. There was, one, there was one. There was one. Act, there was one event. What is it? Oh God! He was a black hacket. He was a black. He was a black contractor, Jacqueline Hackett, black, and okay. he had an account with with, with Canadian. They were not, Bank of Canada. Royal Bank of Canada, yeah. Royal Bank of Canada. And his daughter was highly qualified in accountancy. And he said, this is my daughter. And if you don't employ her, I'm going to take my account away. <laughs> and, she became their, and she became their financial advisor, Jacqueline. The one bishop had school girl who went to school with a car. Yeah. And he just informed them that if you don't employ she qualified. And if you don't employ her, I take my account away. They did. Well, well, in the old days, there was sometimes so the, was, ex the exception of having a black person in a, quite a senior role. Now, do you know, Georgetown was a compulsory pilotage. You couldn't come on. They couldn't sail your boat in without a, a, a pilot on board. And yeah. the harbor master, Captain Walcott, was black. Yes, and, I, um, I went to school with Harmian. The story goes that he was going to bring a ship in, an American ship, and the captain said he wasn't going to have some goddamn, I must say, N word they say now, yeah. telling him what to do. And he said, Well, um, you know, you can either take, accept me as a pilot or you can turn the boat around and go back from whence you came. But um, they, I think they, so the captain went down to his cabin and he left the, the first officer on the bridge. So that's how they got into port. No, there, there was another thing, there was another thing too. That if that this is English, this is English social history. If if you go to scholarship, I don't know if a Queen's College, but until 1939, if you were an illegitimate child and you got a scholarship, you are not accepted in the Bishop's High School. Oh, well, we weren't a Christian school so much. Right? <laughs> we were more, more so, secular so than I remember, that. I remember this headmaster <laughs> telling his friends, he, 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 he said, oh, God, I bet you, are you going to get married so this child can go? He meant them <laughs> to get married so this child can go. And so, and then my friend, Doris, Doris, welcome. Um, the same thing happened to her, but her mother was like uh, attached to the people who were agents of city sewing companies. And they said, it can't happen. And they knew Johnson Nance, who was in the ledge code. And they got on to him. And so unofficially, she was able to go to bishops. So by the time I was ready to go in the January of 1940, I didn't have any problem. Because a, a, a commission came down and removed the ban. You know, um, I, I, I'm, you're reminding me, I think it was Ian's story, was reminding me of um, when I was doing research on Edgar Middlehouse, I went to New Amsterdam and I mm -hmm. met the Bone family and they were saying to me, they could remember, they, would be, they were told, um, oh, there's a doctor who's coming in from Scotland. So New Amsterdam would have this doctor. You know, so everybody was really excited. They'd heard there was this trained doctor who was coming, coming to, to Guyana. And so they were all waiting for the for the doctors to come off the um, the ship or the boat or whatever had, that had just arrived in. 
and people were walking off and they're all looking out for this white man where is this white man and the, and 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 the, and the ship just <laughs> emptied and they and they, they were saying like but hang on wait what happened to the doctor they said oh no the doctor got off a long time ago and it was the first black doctor they'd had in new amsterdam but everyone yeah. was so shocked they didn't realize <laughs> You know, the, same, the same thing used to happen to um, Dr. Francis, the city of Francis' father. Um, black, and he went to Essie Hospital, and the maid, the maid was cleaning the floor, and he did not, do, I think he walked on our floor, and she cast again, saying, I don't clean my floor. She didn't know it was Dr. Francis, <laughs> you know, because he was a white. She yeah. couldn't, yes, yeah, she, she didn't have that for him, yes. So it, 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 I got, I got yeah. one more talking about doctors. I got one more story to tell you. Another in, uh, is this a story or a it's evidently? Uh, well, it's a factual uh, okay, anecdote. Okay. My late grandfather Wishart, who was a doctor, um, before he became the medical officer of health for Georgetown, he was in private practice, and um, he'd been on several house visits, and he was rather tired. He came in the evening. The coachman had put the coach away and the horse away in those days. And um, he was upstairs. It, it was quite a big house, you know, it had three floors. They were upstairs in the bedroom and the front door bell rings. And he tells Granny to look out the window and see who it is. And the man there said he, he wants to see the doctor. This is sort of early evening now. The grandfather was directing the well, is he fit enough to come and ring the bell? He'd be all right by the morning. So he's that's the granny to tell, tell, tell him I'm not in. Man turns up next morning at the surgery, has his examination and everything. When he's finished, he leans across the desk to the grandfather. He says, doctor, I don't want to cause no trouble. But last night when he was out, I did hear a man voice in the bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> comments to say thank you to, I think uh, Christine Samaru and also um, who else did I see actually I've seen some quite comments a, yeah quite a few comments um, mm. Vimal Tawari said um, oh just referring as well to how very active um, the Indian cultural associations were um, yeah. and they involved um, European as well as South Asian um, music and amateur dramatics um, we, we did have a chat last month about um, Al Alice um, Singh, Alice B. Singh, <clears throat> and also um, Raj Kumari Singh. Yeah, um, Kumari, yes. Yeah, and then um, uh, Rahana is saying there were in the late 60s a number of reserved places for Amerindian children in the high schools in Georgetown. Oh. So I didn't, I didn't know that. Thanks for that contribution, Rahana. And then... Um, Vimal is saying, my grandfather went into the interior during World War II as a sick nurse and dispenser because the doctors were fighting in Europe. It's interesting. No cousins, you do? Um, Sh Charlene Wilkinson is just saying, greetings. I'm thinking of the young generation at home now in Guyana and how important these stories are to them. They need to have a reference point for understanding today. Um, so she hopes that uh, we're going to be willing to do some more journaling, which actually I find this format is really nice. I really enjoy having the kind of conversation. So certainly Rod and I would would be interested in um, continuing more more kind of informal conversations. Um, and then Auntie Joyce uh, Colwyn is laughing at your bicycle race and horse race, which is. <laughs> 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 Which was funny. Um, we knew exactly the only race we knew. This is the only race you knew, yeah. And so, and David Chung is mentioning, obviously, that um, do remember we were living through colonialism, which was essentially about divide and rule, uh, underlying and, and hence underlying racial tensions. Um, and yeah, thanks to the British, but no disrespect men, meant there. But yeah. <laughs> Um, Debbie, thanks everyone. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of thanks, basically. Um, and a lot of people seem to enjoy this format, so that's and good. Alexander. Okay. Yeah. Oh, um, 
Great. Oh, and somebody who said something about Alexander here? There was... At the bottom, great show. Oh, uh, great Alex show, guys. Alexander, you got a winner there. Yeah, well, uh, I don't know if you all saw Alexander on uh, Britain's Got Talent, but that I nearly fell off my chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's not going on, though. I have to tell people so they don't get worried about it. What happens in these shows is it doesn't matter if they think you're wonderful. They select people to go forward on. And I'm going to tell you this because I know it's pretty much what the facts are. Uh, they research what you do anyway. They looked at a lot of my little videos on, on YouTube, of which they're like, you've know, got 200 hits or 300 hits. I yeah. put them out. I've got a friend who puts it out for the songs. And they realized it's a very safe show, BGT. They're not going to let my supposedly subversive lyrics hit them. <laughs> and they no, found, but I thought you wrote them, a really... Beautiful piece for the Queen, and I and I agree with you. I mean, oh, no, I agree. Yeah, it's yeah. I, I have no problem with the Queen, and I as I say, it wasn't I wasn't capitalising on this. It was done ten years ago, and they yeah. realised that. But they also realised you're supposed to do a new tune when you go carry yeah. on, right? And they hadn't got any for me. So what they did was, I'm not being um um in any way uh what's the word? How can I say it? I, I'll just say this: they ticked their box for the Jubilee because they didn't have one. Yeah, they didn't have anything yeah. for the Jubilee and the Jubilee Christ, so they ticked their box. Great for me, lo lovely bit of publicity, but no need for me to continue yeah. in an area which is not. Yeah. I mean, I would have had to do something that then you would I would have, have had been to do a song about the Windrush scandal. <laughs> if, if you want to, oh god, yeah. If you want to look up something on YouTube, folks, look up yeah. "Not So Pretty," spelled P-R-E-T-T-Y. Yeah, and yeah. I know yeah. that. Um, um, Roxanne, Roxanne Gleave is watching this because Roxanne's a friend of mine. Roxanne and, 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 and David, we've done, you know, we, we, we've known each other a while because of the, um, the Windrush Foundation stuff. And um, there you'll get uh, uh, more of the, <laughs> the real me. And so it's great, but, and, and it's, you know, I'm great, grateful for them. It's a wonderful experience, but also I'm nice and safe to be out of there. I, I've never watched the show before. I probably won't watch it again. Because <laughs> there's no time. I'm too busy, yeah. you know. Yeah, in, yeah. During the lockdown, I've written 20 songs for all sorts of reasons. Some of them commissioned actually by um, two football songs in that time and, and other things, you know. So, um, yeah, it's 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 nice to be um, recognised. I agree with you. It's a nice song. It was meant to be a nice song. Um, but I have other things too. And uh, it's... Uh, you know, what I was going to, if I got, just let me give me one more minute. I want to talk about my mum. Mm -hmm. My mother was a teacher. She was a very um, formidable lady in the sweetest possible way. She was a wonderful, she became a, what was called a, um, a remedial teacher. Now we call it SEN, right? Um, special yes, educational is. needs. But um, she, what, what was rare at the time is that uh, I used to go to a church youth club, which is at the end of my road from, from the big church. And, um, the there was a young who went to the, to the thing as well she was uh, i'm not gonna she was <clears throat> let's say she was left to a bernardo's home when she was a baby and so she although she got about she was got to the age of 16 and she needed to go into the world if you like they were trying to get her to to be ready to leave uh the home and everything and become and because of my mother's um status I think it's not status in the church sort of going she was known to be a teacher they asked her if she would have this girl as um a foster child she was white she became mum's first foster daughter or first um um not foster daughter what do you call it now when you anyway foster mum yeah she was right then then came tony who came from a home where she was sent to boarding school by her dad and she didn't um uh she ran away from the school at one point she was very unhappy <clears throat> because she was and we had been at school i had been at school with her earlier on she was taken out of the secondary school and sent to um out in the country she ran, left school and, and ran away and came back to london and the first person she called was my mother now we're talking about a black west indian woman in the 60s and mum said where are you she said i'm at some station uh, victoria one of the stations she said stay there i'll come and get you she then became foster daughter. And when I went to America in 73 to 74, when I was touring with a band, when I came back, I had a third foster sister, <laughs> Lorraine. Now these are all white girls. And it shows you in what regard my mother was held by the local council 
and the education system that they would think that she was the right person to bring up these girls. They've all got married in their time, had kids. All the kids called my mother grandma. Um, the girls all called mum mum. She was just mum. And she liked mum. <laughs> she'd go somewhere with them and a couple of them they would, would, would be with them and they'd say, I think, you know, all there was, there was, um, there was we, we actually, we had a Guyanese friend, a, a girl we met, I met at school, um, Leela, who lives in New York now. And Leela and Tony became fast friends at college. And there's a picture of them taken by the local newspaper, the, Bren the Brentford and Chiswick Times, of them on um, a, on the common in Chiswick Common. And they were both art students. And there's a picture of them looking at some art, one black girl, one white girl. And it went in the paper. And in those days, it was quite a rarity. So my mum went to the newspaper and said, you see, that? you've got a picture here of my daughters here. Can you please? So, um, um, Leela wasn't a daughter, but it didn't matter. My daughters, can I have a copy of the photo, please? And they said, where's the photo? She said, this one. She said, your children? She said, yes, yes, don't, 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 don't. I haven't got time. Just, just give me the photo. So she was perfectly, you know, people were astounded. How could this black woman have this white girl as a daughter? But they didn't question it. And um, she was just a most remarkable person in our community. And at the time, kind of broke all kinds of barriers down. I remember another friend um, who was 16, became pregnant, wanted to marry her boyfriend, didn't have a place to stay. She went down to the town hall. She said, the them a flat as soon as you can they found them a flat in a week and this is a black woman demanding of the council so i mean there is we do have in us that spirit of resistance in spite of the fact that divide and rule was meant to divide and rule us we made lots of friends lots of irish friends lots of white friends and black friends in spite of and that's still the case today so it isn't all negative the the, the, the press would like to make you think that it is but there are many many alliances between us um, with people around the world mm. in all sorts of places and I think that gives me hope it gives me hope. especially I mean I live in London which is you know a really multicultural city it's a great city to live in for people of, of different cultures maybe other places aren't so much but this is fine maybe um... <laughs> now, London is is is, is uh, the, the city for uh, you know because Theresa May always has said that thing about if you're a citizen of of the world, you're a citizen of nowhere. Well, mm. I feel like London is a city that represents the citizens of the world. So we, we all have a home, a so, home so, here so in London. Alexander should end on the la uh, on a verse of, of the um of the Kitchener song then. London is the place for me. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. This is interesting because, of course, and I realised at the time I thought, well, wow, this, this song sounds very rose-tinted spectacled, you know, but Kitchener knew what he was doing. He wasn't singing these complimentary verses in order to um, to kowtow, in order to make smooth the path for his his um, his compatriots who were coming to this strange place where they're going to be. So if he said nice things about them, maybe it will make the passage a little bit easier. Yes. That was genius. He was a genius anyway. I mean, he's my favourite Calypsonian of all. But there you go. London. Is the place for me. London, this lovely city. You could go to France or America, India, Asia, or Australia, but you must come back to London City. Now, believe me, I am speaking broad mindedly. I am glad my mother country. Well, I've traveled to countries years ago, but this is the place I wanted to know. London is the place for me. In London, you can be very comfortable because the English people are very much sociable. They will take you here and they'll take you there, make you feel like a millionaire. London, that's the place for me. At night, when you have nothing to do, you can take a walk down Shaftesbury Avenue. There you will talk and laugh and enjoy the wonderful sceneries of London. That's the place for me. No, I cannot complain of the life I have spent. I mean, my time in London is truly magnificent. 
I have every comfort and every sport, and my residence is at Hampton Court, London. That's the place for me. <laughs> my residence is at Hampton Court. He was so cheeky. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm just yes, gonna switch you. the um the recording off.